Consumer Protection Committee for March 21, 2024. Senator Morrison. Welcome to the committee. Senate file 3561 is in front of us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, I appreciate the opportunity to present Senate File 3561, the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act. And Mr. Chair, I do have the A-17 amendment. Senator Wickland offers the A-17 amendment to your amendment, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The amendment uh, includes a series of changes requested by producers and also includes revisions to create consistency with this program and the lessons learned from other states in implementing their programs. So the amendment includes an exemption for all newspapers, uh, and there is a letter in your packet from them. Uh, it exempts commercial, industrial, and institutional material, and the bill focuses, so it focuses the bill on residential materials. It revises the recyclables and compostables list to create consistency with other states uh, and establishes criteria for alternative collection systems. It creates, it creates a new reimbursement formula for service providers and how the pro or producer responsibility organization uh, reimburses those providers, removing contracting language. It eliminates the, quote, rates and dates requirements and instead requires the pro and PCA to establish new goals based on a needs assessment. And it adjusts toxic substances reporting to clarify what is reported. So that's kind of a high-level view of the amendment, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Senator uh, Morrison. I think what we'll do is have the committee vote on the amendment, uh, and then we will go to your testifiers. I'm going to count my people here. Last four. Uh, members all in favor of the A-17 say aye. 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 Opposed? A-17 is adopted. Could I have uh, Commissioner Halverson and Nels Paulson come forward, please? Welcome to the committee. Commissioner, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Lori Halverson, Dakota County Commissioner, and I'm here today on behalf of the Minna Minnesota Intercounty Association, MICA. Um, and I want to thank Senator Mor Morrison for her leadership in carrying this bill. Um, it has a big impact on counties, and that's why uh, MICA is here today. I'm pleased to talk to you about why Senate File 3561, the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act, is so important to our counties. As you know, under state law, counties are responsible for reducing the waste streams in Minnesota. This is especially important in places like Dakota County where we are the host of some of the largest landfills in the state of Minnesota. Um, most of the waste that we store in these landfills comes from outside of Dakota County. Um, and it's, it's been something that the residents and the leaders of Dakota County have managed for many, many years on behalf of the region, um, but we take very seriously the responsibility of making sure that we are not allowing these landfills to creep and to further impact um, development and economic growth in Dakota County. Unfortunately, in spite of all of the county's efforts to reduce packaging, and this has been through um, efforts working with our cities, it's been through um, creating uh, recycling uh, opportunities uh, beyond uh, curbside pickup through our recycling zone that we currently host uh, in Egan and the one that we're building in partnership with Scott County in the southern part of the district. It's been in spite of our efforts to um, uh, require our cities to do recycling pickup. Um, there's always that carrot and stick um, uh, relationship that is happening and we do as much carrot as possible and our cities have done wonderful things. Um, it's been in spite of the fact that we are um, also hosting multiple um, com compostable um, drop-off sites as well. Um, suffice it to say that the county is investing millions of taxpayer dollars in reducing the waste stream and meeting the goals that the state has set for us. And we believe fully in this work. Um, 
You know that um, the state also supports these efforts through its SCORE grants, but we can tell you that um, what we receive, what counties receive in SCORE grants, um, is about four to five times less than the recycling efforts that we are um, undertaking. And so even though we continue to partner with the state, the counties really do share um, the largest um, financial burden when it comes to trying to um, move uh, waste out of the waste stream. I'll say when I became a Dakota County Commissioner, I called a co co colleague of mine after I had my first hour-long conversation about solid waste, and I said, now I feel like a county commissioner because I've been talking solid waste. It's a big deal. Um, I, I called uh, you, um, uh, Mr. Chair, because um, I, I was thinking about this bill as I was driving to the Dakota County offices past one of our large landfills, and it was a windy day, and there was a lot of garbage flying around, and I had other things on my mind, and so I didn't hit my air recirculation button and, and smelled it. So it has a big impact on our communities, a really big impact. Um, and given the, the needs that we have, it's important to note that even though we've got a target to hit of 75% recyclables and waste stream diversion by 2030, the, the counties have plateaued at about 40% of that diversion. So in, with all of the efforts that I described and more, because we focused on what's under our power and we focused on our residents and we focused on our, um, the businesses that, that we run with regard to our um, waste removal. And we can't do it alone anymore. We really need the um, manufacturers to be a, the third leg in that stool to help all of us reach our goals to divert 75% of the waste out of the waste streams. And even with all that, Dakota County is going to have to increase um, one of our landfills by 25 million tons in capacity, and another by almost um, 10 million tons. So the stakes are extremely high. And without the producers, the packaging producers, coming to the table and being part of the solution, we won't be able to meet that 75% reduction goal. And I'll leave you with one last thought. When I was coming to testify of this bill, I, was, I, I had the memory of being a Girl Scout 40 plus years ago, probably almost 50 years ago. And um, I did a project in my Girl Scout troop about um, packaging waste reduction and how important it is. And, um, you know, advocating to our local grocers about uh, packaging waste reduction. And here we are almost 50 years later, and we're still having this conversation. And it hasn't changed. The things that I learned as a Girl Scout um, in terms of how we can reduce packaging uh, waste really haven't changed when I look at my store selves. So I would love to see um, all all of these sectors coming together to support these goals. And I thank uh, Senator Morrison for bringing this bill forward. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. And as you clear the table, can Mr. Kudelka come forward? Mr. Paulson, please introduce yourself and proceed. <clears throat> My name is Nels Paulson, and I serve as the policy director at Conservation Minnesota, and I was never a Girl Scout. <laughs> We are a statewide nonprofit advocacy organization with members in all 87 of Minnesota's counties. We advocate at the state capitol on issues our members tell us are important to them, and this includes policies involving recycling and garbage. I'll begin by re reiterating the problem. We have a trash problem. We now know that burying or burning our trash is not a sustainable long-term solution. We know that we need to stop feeding landfills and incinerators like the Hennepin Energy Recovery Center or the HERC. We need to stop feeding landfills and trash incinerators to meet our statewide climate action goals. While, <clears throat> while total recycling rates have been stuck around 40% for years, the amount of trash we generate is growing. The MPCA tells us that the amount of trash generated in the metro is expected to grow almost 20% by 2042. Over about the same time, global plastic production is expected to double and we are running out of landfill capacity to manage our trash problem. We need solutions. One important piece of the puzzle is the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act. 
We participated in years of stakeholder meetings and bill development because we recognize the importance of getting this bill right. The fingerprints of dozens of stakeholders are on this bill, including numerous amendments to this bill this session. This bill will make significant progress by disincentivizing single-use plastics and wasteful packaging by implementing eco-modulated fees. Reducing the amount of garbage we produce is the backbone of this bill, and over the next five to 10 years, producers will finally become accountable to reducing wasteful packaging and single-use plastics. Producer accountability is lacking in our current system. You may hear from producers of single-use plastics and landfill owners who oppose this bill and make the argument, we don't need to do anything about waste and recycling because Minnesota is already a recycling leader. My reply is for you to ask around. Ask Burnsville or Invergrove Heights how high their new mountains of garbage are going to be at their overflowing landfills. Ask someone younger than me if they think Minnesota is a leader on reducing single-use plastics and wasteful packaging. Our trash problem is only getting worse, and that's nothing to be proud of. Luckily, some producers are already setting goals that are well aligned with this bill. Did you know that General Mills has committed to making all their brands packaging reusable or recyclable by 2030? That's years before this bill would have required. In summary, our statewide trash and recycling problems are complex, and this will require innovative policies to push us towards zero waste. This act is a major piece of the puzzle to get Minnesota on track. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. And as you clear, can Gabby Batsko please come to the table? Mr. Kudelka, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. For the record, my name is Kirk Kudelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. First off, I want to thank Senator Morrison for championing this important bill, which the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency supports. Collectively, Minnesota, we have a waste problem. 6.1 million tons each year is thrown away. And as you heard before, it's only expected to continue to grow. We only recycle about 45% of it, which means over half of it is thrown away in a waste energy facility or a landfill. We still have a ways to go to reach the goals set out in the Waste Management Act that was passed by you, the legislature. For example, a 75% recycling goal by 2030 for the metropolitan area. The results of throwing away nearly half of our waste has not only environmental and human health impacts, but also economic impacts. The impacts for the entire life cycle of products we produce and use are enormous. Just to show the, illustrate the benefits of waste reduction, reuse, and recycling and composting, Minnesota saves about 4.6 million tons of carbon dioxide when we reduce waste, recycle, and compost. That's equivalent to 970,000 passenger vehicles on our highways. There's also an economic loss. We throw away nearly 1 million tons of recycled materials that are valued over $143 million a year. We pay to throw away valuable materials. If we were to use those in businesses, instead we could create over 15,000 jobs. While Minnesota has accomplished some good things, we can't rest on our laurels or we'll risk sliding backwards. And we're already starting to see cracks in our system here in Minnesota. Communities are finding it harder and harder to provide curbside recycling. An example is Virginia, Minnesota. Earlier this year, they stopped providing curbside recycling services because of the $400,000 cost of their budget. However, they're not alone. Bemidji, Hibbing, and other similar sized communities have previously made that same decision because of costs becoming too much. While we still have good local markets for recycled materials, we're also starting to see large manufacturers close or reduce services because they're not able to get the materials and be profitable. We need strong local markets. They're the lifeblood of any recycling program. The public and local governments that are providing these recycling services will see a number of savings in the area due to the bill. Those paying directly for curbside recycling will see those costs and their monthly bill covered by the PRO, the Producer Responsibility Organization, for the collection and processing of those materials. Cities are, that provide curbside recycling which are many in the metro and in greater Minnesota, will see those costs covered. I mentioned earlier the cost, $400,000 for the city of Virginia. In addition, as other testifiers have mentioned, counties are spending millions of dollars to fulfill their part of the Waste Management Act, which this bill would help. However, the, while we are seeing those cost savings, we're not seeing uh, any cost increases on the other side. Experiences in Canada and Europe have shown there's no change to consumer prices from these extended producer responsibility programs. This program is just one minor factor in the larger marketing price of packaged materials. Companies incorporate these compliance costs across the entire business and 
<clears throat> and many are paying a premium to get these recycled materials. This will make it easier for them to meet their own sustainability goals. So in summary, this legislation provides Minnesota with a system and resources for us to reach our legislative set goals for waste packaging and address important cost issues for consumers. The MPCA's 2022 Sustainable Materials and Solid Waste Policy Report recommends the establishment of a product stewardship program for packaging, just like this bill. There's no need to wait for another re report. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Thank you, Mr. Kudelka. And as you clear, can Amber Backhouse come forward? Ms. Basco, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Gabby Batsko. I'm the coordinator for the Tri-County Solid Waste Commission of Stearns, Benton, and Sherburn counties. And today I'm speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Solid Waste Administrators Association, where I'm acting as the president-elect. Um, today we're elated to be here to show support for Senate File 3561. Uh, SWA is an organization of county and solid waste district professionals and related solid waste professionals um, and is an affiliate of the Association of Minnesota Counties, or AMC, which represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. SWA advocates for policies that improve and promote responsible waste management. For the 2024 session, SWA has prioritized action to move the dial on a significant segment of the waste stream, and that's packaging. The EPA stated that in 2021, roughly 15% of methane produced in the United States came specifically from landfills. In Minnesota, waste is landfilled in counties throughout both the metro and greater Minnesota. And if we don't start advancing solutions to our waste problem in all forms, waste will continue to be landfilled, greenhouse gases, uh, will continue to rise, and all Minnesotans will begin to feel the impacts of a rapidly changing world due to this inaction. We support a producer-led material re reduction, reuse, repair, and recycling program to reduce a product's life cycle impacts, impacts on the environment and public health, and that is consistent with the Minnesota waste hierarchy a hierarchy that prioritizes reduction and reuse of waste and urges us away from landfilling. EPR must include transparency and accountability measures, maximize and build off of existing infrastructure, and pr provide local governments with a voluntary role in development and displace taxpayer funding for recycling and reuse. And we urge you to consider about the cost of not supporting climate and sustainability action. What's the cost to the environment, public health, and industry to not prioritize this type of resilience for our communities? We support the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act and believe it will lead to an improved recyclability of product packaging, a reduction in packaging waste, and incentivize sustainable packaging choices, all of which are necessary for our state to meet its state waste and climate goals, such as a clean economy, which is outlined in Minnesota's Climate Action Framework. Um, if you have any questions related to waste in your specific districts, um, please feel free to let me know. Um, otherwise, thank you wholeheartedly for your time today. Thank, thank you, you, Ms. Batsko. And can Mr. Tim Wilkin please come forward? Ms. Backus, please introduce yourself and proceed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus with United Strategies, and I'm here on behalf of the National Waste and Recycling Association's Minnesota chapter and the member companies that have generated over 17,000 jobs and provide collection, sorting, recycling, and disposal of waste in Minnesota. NWRA member companies have been an integral part of making Minnesota's recycling system work, a system which consistently ranks as one of the top in the country. Up until introduction of the A-17 amendment, which we saw for the first time last night, our concerns about the impacts of Senate File 3561 on our businesses, customer relationships, and payment for services had not been addressed. We are grateful to finally see some language that removes the brand manufacturers through the producer responsibility organization from being in the middle of our contracts with local governments and residential customers. We also appreciate a nod to reimbursement language which covers more than our direct costs and permits reimbursement for investments in recycling facilities and infrastructure. There are still some conflicts in the language of the A17 and details that need to be ironed out. I do want to give a heartfelt thanks to Senator Morrison and this committee for taking steps in the right direction, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with the author and proponents as we are still in the process of reviewing the amendment language. There is one new issue in the A-17 that I do want to flag. Historically, the legislature has set recycling goals for the state, which the MPCA then implements. The language in the A-17 on page 5 removes the legislature from the process and has the uh, MPCA and the Producer Responsibility Organization establishing the state's recycling rates. 
We'd prefer the legislature have more oversight of this program, not less, and would ask the author and members to insert more legislative checkpoints as this new program is developed. Again, we're grateful for recognition of our concerns and look forward to working through the outstanding issues to protect the businesses and infrastructure that have helped to make Minnesota a leader in recycling. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Backus. Can Mr. Tony Quillis please come forward? Mr. Wilkin, welcome to the committee. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, my name is Tim Wilkin, and I'm the president of the Minnesota Beverage Association, which represents the makers and distributors of most non-alcoholic beverages. I want to thank Senator Morrison and the advocates for our conversation on the bill and for listening to our concerns. Our industry has actually supported what we consider to be well-designed EPR legislation in Colorado. The amendment you just adopted did take some significant steps to address our concerns. The complexity of a 10-page amendment on a 37-page bill means we still have some remaining concerns and need further time to analyze a very complex bill. We thank the author for taking out uh, commercial, industrial, and institutional provisions out of the bill and narrowing the scope to residential. The source reduction definition and goals are based though on unmeasurable factors. We recommend a quantifiable uh, basis for this type of metric, such as reduction in virgin material usage. The language still gives the commissioner broad authority to set percentage uh, rates and percentages of post-consumer recycled content. Most of our members already have aggressive goals in this area and the material needs to be available. The bill <laughs> continues to give wide latitude for banning packages and products based on criteria that are not spelled out in the bill or are ambiguous. That produces an unacceptable level of uncertainty for companies doing business in Minnesota and hands too much discretion over to the MPCA with no legislative approval. Provisions for public space recycling are still virtually unlimited and need to be carefully defined. The amendment also addresses the problematic language around contracting responsibilities of the PRO, though in, uh, in clarifying reimbursement requirements, the amendment raises some new questions about the scope and, and the basis of reimbursements for, for that require further examination. The PRO is charged with improving the design of pr producers' products, provide technical support for producers, improving product labels. All of these are beyond the appropriate role for the PRO and cannot be, uh, and which cannot dictate uh, decisions that are made by producers from all over the world. Changes were made uh, to the needs assessment uh, to the prior language, which was clearly too broad, but the new language is actually more complex. The amendment did address some of our concerns about reimbursement language by netting out uh, scrap and cons um, commodity values, which is an important improvement and may include some, but may include some new problems with downstream costs of converting material to new products. And fi finally, the state should not have the authority to approve and deny invest, uh, individual uh, investments by producers. Without these reasonable changes, we're not in a position to support the bill at this time. We do suggest that before passing the bill, the, ledger take, the legislature take a look at dedicating the portion of the solid waste tax, which is currently diverted to the general fund. This would give the state and counties an additional $33 million a year to, to, um, that consumers already assume is going toward waste reduction and improving recycling. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Mr. Quillis, please proceed. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tony Quillis, and I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank you for the opportunity to make a couple of comments on Senate File 3561. As you've heard, Mr. Chairman um, and members from previous testifiers, Minnesota is one of the leaders in recycling efforts. We have a robust recycling infrastructure here and some of the highest recycling rates in the nation, no matter how many, how you look at the statistics or data, we're somewhere between 9th and 12th. But what makes us unique and different from other states is we have a solid waste tax here in Minnesota. 
It's 9.75% on us as individuals and 17% on commercial and industrial facilities. It raises well over $100 million a year. This legislature also, through its capital investment and bonding bills, has invested millions of dollars to expand local recycling and composting infrastructure, and that doesn't include the millions of dollars of private investment that have been put into the solid waste infrastructure here in Minnesota. So we have a system that's set up, and it's adequate and well-funded here in Minnesota, Mr. Chairman and members. But there's another part that I'd like to, to bring up is Last year, this legislature appropriated $680,000 to the Pollution Control Agency to go through and do a resource management analysis of our current system in the solid waste programs here in Minnesota. Asked them to look at current waste prevention programs, impacts and the opportunities, and also to come back with a summary, programs and resources needed to reduce waste by 90% by 2045. That report is due back here in July of 2025. So Mr. Chairman and members, I think maybe we should pause before we start a whole new system, go through, wait for this report to come back, get the data, the statistics that tell us where we need to focus and what we need to do, and then move on and make a plan from there. So Mr. Chairman, members, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Quillis. That's it for our testifiers. Before we go to member comments and questions, I just want to congratulate the author. Uh, oh, there's another member of the public that wants to come forward. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Julie Ketchum. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for WM Waste Management. Uh, we have recycling, curbside recycling services, and we also have a Twin Cities Recycling Facility that we are investing millions of dollars in upgrades for. Um, both of these services uh, incur debt and our issue, our concern is with um, getting paid, just simply getting paid for the service that we're providing so that we can pay down that debt. I'd like to thank um, Senator Morrison and the proponents of the bill for working out a lot of uh, new changes here. But our legal department needs to review some of those changes, and we've already highlighted a few uh, inconsistencies and contradictions in the bill, uh, as noted by Amber Backus and NWRA. Um, so we, uh, a couple of those are that um, it's not clear in the bill whether we can charge for service or not. So in one section, it allows us to charge for the service, and in another, it doesn't. Um, and then a bigger issue is, can we elect to participate in the EPR program, or are we compelled or required uh, to participate in the, in the uh, program? There are a couple of issues that um, the pro, the brand owners, um, are involved in our business, and frankly, they don't know our business. So one of those is um, on uh, efficiencies. So month or same day collection and frequency of collection. So if you're in Baudette, Minnesota, are you going to have you know, weekly collection? So what you're going to do is drive up collection costs by those requirements, by having a certain frequency of collection. It drives up collection costs, fuel use, and greenhouse gas emissions. So that, right now, uh, Dakota County has a requirement like that and um, we have had to seek uh, a variance from that. Everyone in the industry has. Um, and then lastly, just in general, we, we hope, uh, we, have, we are cautiously optimistic about continued work with the proponents of the bill and with the authors on some of these changes. And again, uh, legal review of uh, fair market value and some of those more detailed questions. Um, and then lastly, uh, legislative oversight. It's already been said, but Colorado, Maine, uh, Oregon, California, they all have checkpoints in the process. And as Mr. Quillis said, to uh, do the resource management report first, check in with the legislature, do the needs assessment first, check in with the legislature. There's got to be legislative oversight uh, for some parts of this process. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to comment, and I look forward to continued conversations. Thank you for your testimony. Are there other members of the public that wish to testify on 3561 as amended? 
I just want to thank the author for working with opponents and proponents alike on uh, with the A17. I think it sounds like from our testimony, you've moved a lot of people from you know sort of open opposition to at least uh, consideration of this bill. Members, before we go to your comments, the path forward for this bill will be that it will be passed to the Environment Committee, where from most of the con remaining concerns that I've heard, uh, those could be addressed. So, member questions, comments, or amendments? <coughs> Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for the bill author, and I'm looking at the A17 that was adopted. Um, and starting at, on page two, line 20, and going down to page two, line 29, uh, there's a list of factors uh, that should be evaluated for each covered material collected for recycling and composting. And when I look at page two, line 29, it just throws in uh, quote, other criteria or factors determined by the commissioner. And so, Mr. Chair, I was wondering if the bill author could explain what that's trying to capture, um, because, it, it, you know, above that uh, sentence, there's a list of a, a whole host of factors that are um, enumerated in terms of uh, different evaluation criteria. Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rasmussen. I think that that's just giving um, the commissioner, uh, we could certainly ask Assistant Commissioner Kadalka to join us if he wants to add, but just creating a little bit of flexibility in terms of what should be added. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Morrison, for the response. And I, I guess that is just concerning to me that we basically have an open door where other criteria or factors determined by the commissioner um, I think if, if there are some things that need to be included, we should discuss and debate that. Um, th there's, uh, again, availability of recycling and compost and collection services, recycling and composting processing infrastructure, capacity and technology for sorting covered materials, availability of responsible end markets, uh, the, 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 and the list goes on. Um, and I'm just concerned that we don't know what this other criteria and factors determined by the commissioner could be used for. Um, another concern I have, which is brought up by some of the testifiers, I believe it's on page five of the amendment, is taking the statewide recycling requirements and handing that over to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, um, and, and again, not having legislative oversight over that um, criteria. And I understand the, the policy goal of trying to reduce waste. I think that is an admirable goal. Uh, but I worry that uh, if we're just handing over too much power to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, if they want to add new criteria to the list, if they think we should recommend uh, some changes in our statewide requirements, they can certainly introduce a proposal and we can discuss and debate the merits of it. So I just would like to see um, some of that uh, tightened up and transferred back to the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any response, Mr. Kudelka? Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, for the record, my name is Kirk Adelko, Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, thank you for the question. As we continue to go through the needs assessment, there will be things that others may bring up, producers or the waste hauling industry, that they would like to see as part of that decision-making process and information gathering. And so this allows for us to adapt and listen to the stakeholders and make sure the report can incorporate those things in there because the needs assessment is a, a large basis of information for folks to move forward, whether it's the plan or other pieces. So we just want to make sure that we're responsive to stakeholders. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And a question for the Assistant Commissioner. Is that needs assessment ready? Is that something that we can review today? Mr. Kudelka. Um, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members, no. They would be produced after this was passed. And so there wouldn't be, that's where we can then be able to address those stakeholders as they continue to move after the bill is passed. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Assistant Commissioner. And I guess my um, thoughts on this would be let's have that needs assessment first. It's my understanding that Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is, is looking at other opportunities to reduce uh, waste and to increase recycling, which I think are great. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think we should be passing a bill and then finding out what changes need to be made to the legislation. And so I just worry. I, I think admirable goal. I think this is important work. Um, but maybe we need to have that report back. We need to get that information so we can actually figure out what criteria should be in the bill, what the goals for recycling should be statewide before we move a proposal forward. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ray. Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Senator Morrison. I know you put in a lot of work on this. Um, our environmental questions often boil down to this. How are we going to get the majority of the public to come along with us to meet our environmental goals? It's the same for me with uh, carbon emission reduction. It's the same in solid waste. 
And um, it's no secret that I've had some concerns about the bill. And what I'm asking the members of the committee to, to do is to figure out what's it going to take for us to make real progress on this. What's it going to take to get the public to buy in? And in my experience, that often involves having the stakeholders have some skin in the game and move as many stakeholders as possible to neutral, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Morrison, uh, I'll cut to the punchline. I do not plan to stand in front of the bill passing out of committee today, but I do have some concerns, and I hope you won't mind if I go through them. Um, Senator Rasmussen already mentioned the question of legislative <laughs> oversight and the timing of the report. I think those are valid questions. Solid waste, I think, is quickly rising in the eyes of the public and of the people that work at this Capitol. It's a higher priority than it's been at any times during my eight years. I think the state has to put its money where its mouth is. It's also no secret that I ask. We had 17 billion extra million, extra dollars last year in surplus funds, and I did not see a commitment to reducing solid waste or incentivizing the public or the manufacturers to make this a priority. I hope we'll be reconsidering that when we get to budget stuff next year. I think we should put much more of our money where our mouth is. I also think as we look at the issue, uh, we'll have to accept that uh, landfill issues are a greater urgency here in the metro, in particular Hennepin County. That's not good or bad, it's just a fact. Uh, this bill was um, dropped and I got calls immediately from producers who employ working men, men and women in Minnesota who said, I don't like it, let's not do it. I will accept the A-17 amendment has made some real progress. And uh, part of my decision on my vote today is that I think you deserve space to continue those conversations. Um, I really do. I guess, you know, the rest of it is just kind of stuff that we talk about, Mr. Chair, which is, we will make durable long-term solutions when everybody's at the table. And one of the things I will promise you, Senator, is that if we're able to get a stakeholder group that can weigh in in a way where we're able to tell the producers and manufacturers, you're in this stakeholder group to have a say, not to get your way. And it's easier to tell a group of manufacturers, producers, employers, uh, that they're not getting everything they want if they had a seat at the table because then they lose the argument that, hey, we weren't really consulted, we're not a part of it. And I think that's true of all the advocates here, and I know many of them in this room have worked very hard. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if I'm a yes or an abstain, but I am not a no on the bill in sending it out to environment, and I appreciate your work, Senator Morrison. Um, obviously, the consensus here, I think, is that there's more work to do, whether that'll be a successful conclusion in this session or not. I guess we'll see. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Senator Franks. Other member questions or comments? Senator Morrison, any closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, really appreciate the conversation, and I'm grateful to certainly the, the advocates who have worked for years uh, on this legislation, uh, but the stakeholders as well. I really appreciate the engagement, and I hope that everyone knows and hears me when I say I'm willing to listen and talk to and engage with everyone to try to find a path that everyone can live with. We have a problem that we can't put off any longer. We have a gigantic and growing waste stream problem. Our landfills are growing. With our clean energy goals, we cannot continue to proceed with waste to energy. Incinerating is, we're not gonna burn our way out of this problem. Um, we need to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the public wants this. I mean, to your point, Senator Frentz, the public believes that we should be able to recycle more. Um, and plastic is increasingly on people's minds. We need to decrease our waste stream. This is a path for us to do it. Thank you very much for uh, your attention, your conversation. Um, I hope to earn everyone on the committee's support. Questions on the motion of Senator Wickland that the Senate file 3561 is amended, be recommended to pass, and referred to the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion is passed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. <coughs> Senator Frantz. Senator Friends, Senate File 1037 is in front of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for consideration of Senate File 1037. Um, one of the things I think the Senate Commerce Committee's done a great job of is costs. 
Uh, we're here to protect consumers and stick up for them, not just on the rules that we make, but on the things that uh, we ask them to take out of their pockets and pay. And as you know, Senate File 1037 addresses health care costs and the question of defrail. What does defrail mean? Defrail means that if we're going to add a mandate and it's going to add a cost, that we're going to have uh, someone other than the consumer take primary acceptance of it. I think that's exactly the kind of thing this committee should be looking at. I'll uh, spare you the lecture about health care costs rising. I think that kind of speaks for itself. The question is, what do we want to do about it? What I'm asking for you here, uh, members, is to consider a path forward to when we add an, a mandated benefit, are we going to consider the cost? Um, and Mr. Chair, with those opening brief remarks, I believe uh, there's an amendment. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A1 amendment, and I'm happy to describe the amendment. A1 is in our packet. Senator Rasmussen moves the A1 to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I really appreciate the bill author uh, bringing this bill forward. I think it's really important, um, and you're right. I think this committee uh, has done a good job of asking the questions of what do different mandates cost, which parts of the healthcare ecosystem do they cover, um, and so I'm very much in support of Senator Frentz's bill here today. The A1 amendment would address some concerns um, about the, the cost of this bill that were raised by the Department of Commerce. And the amendment will simply um, align the defrayal uh, proposal here with the current defrayal process under the Affordable Care Act. And so it'll follow the federal um, system in, in terms of determining the, the defrayal costs. And Mr. Chair, the important thing is with this amendment adopted, there wouldn't be a cost uh, to this proposal, but in the future, if a, another mandate were to come forward that had a cost for Minnesotans that increased the cost of health care, then the defrayal framework would make sure that this legislature paid for that. And so I would ask for members' uh, support of both the A1 amendment and the underlying bill. Further discussion on the A1 from the committee? Senator Rasmussen moves the A1 to 1037. Senator Frentz. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Mr. Chair and Senator Rasmussen, just want to make clear, I consider this a friendly amendment. I think this should go on the bill, and I think it makes it better. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Chair. All in favor of the A1, say aye. 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 Opposed? A1 is adopted. Member questions or comments on 1037 as amended? Testify. I do have a testifier, Mr. Chair. Let's if go to Mr. Bentley Graves. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Bentley Graves with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I want to I want to thank both the committee and Senator Friends for uh, for bringing this this forward and for the discussion today, uh, Mr. Chair. Seventy percent of our members who offer health insurance to their employees do so through the fully insured market, which, as the members of this committee well know, is the state regulated market that is uh, within the purview uh, of this committee. And uh, every year we survey our members and ask them what it is that uh, they would like state policymakers to put a priority on at the state legislature. And not surprisingly then, given that most of them fall into this state regulated market, um, they typically year in, year out, point to uh, uh, work on health care affordability as, as a top concern. But we know that, uh, that uh, each year as this committee and others in the legislature uh, deal with proposals to add uh, mandates to our statute, coverage mandates to our statute, it exposes a tension in that discussion between the benefits offered by those to, to those seeking it, but also the cost. In this bill, Mr. Chair, is an opportunity for the state to invest in the health of those seeking the health benefits of additional coverage while preventing the rest of the market from additional costs. And this is a particularly important here in Minnesota, Mr. Chair, in that we know from researchers at the University of Minnesota that Minnesota families currently have the third highest all-in healthcare spending in the country. And so this bill enlists the state as a partner in improving the health of Minnesotans when state policymakers decide that there is a policy or public health imperative for additional coverage. And Mr. Chair, I'll just close by saying, you know, there are a number of components of the cost of health insurance in Minnesota that are outside the control of this body uh, or of the legislature uh, at large. But only the legislature can choose whether or not to add new required benefits to the health insurance sold in the state. In those circumstances, when a decision is made to do so, the legislature can ensure that its actions don't add to the heavy cost burden that already makes Minnesota a national outlier in this respect. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to offer these comments. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Sorry for almost missing you. Senator Wickland. Thank you. Um, I guess the question, 
Senator Friends, and I don't know if the Department of Commerce is here. Um, can you tell me how does the A1 amendment change the current process that we've been using? Because we have calculated defrayal costs in the past, and we have actually set aside money for the defrayal, defrayal costs. But how would this change how, what the Commerce Department is doing? So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Wicklin. My understanding is that it would require us to come up with the money uh, when we change it in a way that uh, not only conforms to the ACA, but um, going forward, I would not mind if the department came up. Obviously, they have a little more sophistication than I do on the way they're doing it now. Perhaps Mr. Graves to Senator Wicklin. Sure, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, and Senator Wicklin, so the, the amendment would just, just make very clear that, that the deferral process that this bill envisions matches the, the process that, that the state is currently required to follow under federal rules when a benefit mandate moves forward that would require federal defrayal. So there are separate rules when the federal government requires defrayal, uh, as you noted with, uh, with some of the bills moving through. This would just mimic that process for this bill going forward for, for the rest of them. Senator Wickland. Okay, so I guess I'd like clarity then is that, does that mean that there's gonna be a different, a, a separate calculation of a state impact cost that we would be committing to with this as opposed to what we've stated today you know when we come up with a there's a defrayal amount and we have set that aside um, I don't remember exactly which mandate last year but I mean we have done that so you're saying that this is going to be a separate calculation of a state commitment Senator uh, Mr. Graves Mr. Chair and, and Senator Wicklin, what's required currently under federal law uh, requires defrayal in certain circumstances for certain new mandates for only uh, the individual market. Uh, the proposal here would take that same process and, and uh, apply it more broadly, out, you know, not just the, the small sliver of mandates that, that the federal government requires defrayal for, but broaden that out to, to all mandates for the entire market. Senator Wicklin. Um, okay, thank you. I mean, that helps me understand it better. I guess I would say that I don't think I can support the bill okay. without a lot, without more information about what the impact is, and and maybe some examples of how that would, how what that would have played out with some existing mandate reviews that we've done, and kind of what we would be looking at. So, thanks, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. And I'll admit. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit outside the realm of my expertise per se uh, as it relates to this topic, but I think Senator Wicklin's point is well taken. And, and uh, anytime we're going to commit the state to an expenditure in the future that we really don't have situational awareness of, we do run a little bit of a risk. The only thing that um, the only positive I see in this instance is uh, we're committing to that expense uh, in the hopes that it keeps things affordable for everybody uh, as much as possible. And when we look at uh, mandates, especially ones that are unfunded, whether they be this one or an education, for example, knowing what those costs are going to be or having the ability to accurately forecast or project what those expenses could possibly be is important. So I understand the hesitancy uh, to commit the state to that, not knowing what those numbers might be. However, um, I, I agree with the effort here to broaden uh, w the situations in which the state would step in in the attempt to hopefully keep costs lower and affordable for the maximum amount of people. And I think that's something that we need to, to be mindful of as we continue to move forward specific to health insurance as rates continue to climb and, and become more and more expensive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Daines. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I see there's a fiscal note here that uh, deals with this. So I wonder if we could get somebody to go through the fiscal note. That might explain what the cost and stuff would be to satisfy some of those sure. questions. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the fiscal note in your packets for Senate file 1037 was completed uh, last March in 2023. So there may be a need for an updated fiscal note to reflect any changes since then. Um, but I can walk through what's provided in your packets right now. On the second page of the fiscal note, um, under assumptions for the Commerce Department, there are some staff assumed costs to review defrayal, defrayal requests and also to um, provide guidance for health plans. That is the number that is showing up 157000 a year. Um, that's reflecting the staff cost to the Department of Commerce 
And uh, in the last line of the, under the assumptions, Commerce uh, states they're unable to estimate the cost of the premium deferral payments. Um, and I'll just point out in the long-term fiscal considerations on page three, uh, the department assumes that this proposal may significantly increase costs um, going forward. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Frentz or Senator Rasmussen, I think you had the amendment. Can you tell us how that affects this arrest, this amendment will affect this cost. As I understand, that'll drive the cost down. Is that? Uh... Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dames. That's an important question. Yes, the A1 amendment was designed to ad address some of the uh, costs in that fiscal note. And I think it's really important um, when we're talking about this, this bill would only impact future mandates we would look at the cost of future proposed mandates. And so the Department of Commerce wouldn't have to do any work unless a mandate was proposed and passed by this legislature. Um, and a good example of this is actually in Senate File 1704, uh, which members of this committee may remember as uh, the insurance mandate for infertility services. And here, as a part of uh, the funding for that bill, uh, the Department of Commerce is is requesting and would be receiving uh, money for both the frail and then uh, $17,000 a year for the administration of payments for defrail costs uh, for coverage of infertility treatment. And so again, the old, these costs would only materialize if this bill were adopted into law and in the future the legislature were, were passing additional mandates. And so I would see the cost being ascribed to those additional mandates like we have done with the infertility services. Um, and the amendment is to align the process for determining those costs with the process through the ACA. Sir. Thank you. Other member questions or comments? Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman, uh, may I, Mr. I may have missed this, but where does this bill go from here? We are laying this bill over Senator Latz. Uh, the hope is that we will be able to address the fiscal note with the A1 and possibly include it in the policy omnibus uh, of this committee. Okay, and, and it's not expected to be reviewed by Health and Human Services? Uh, there was no, no pathway for it to go through Health and Human Services. All right. Thank you. Senator Frentz. Um, well, first of all, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the last time, I think this committee's done a nice job on the cost issue. Um, what we're asking basically is to create a pause, a moment of consideration in the future when there's another mandate. I think the public wants us to take a, a breath before we mandate additional costs. And as we've heard so many times in this committee, those things that increase costs hurt the Minnesotans that make the least the hardest. And so with that um, and with the explanation of the amendment, um, notwithstanding the fact that uh, we're going to lay it over, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this heard again. And again, hope that the, the Commerce Committee and the Senate will continually ask questions about um, what things cost because I think this is one of the most important stops for the American working men and women to say, how are you keeping costs down? And this is just one of those ways. Thank you, Senator Friends. I'm going to jump on top of your closing comments just with my own apologies. Um, I brought this forth uh, on, in our last hearing of the year quite purposely. This committee is going to continue to hear you know, suggestions for mandates on the uh, health insurance market in the range of you know five to 20 proposals every year. Each one of them individually sounds great. We should absolutely do this for patients. Collectively, uh, they spell the demise of the health insurance industry. They add up each one individually to a per member per month cost that ultimately becomes unsustainable. Uh, we already do defrail by the Department of Commerce on certain uh, medical mandates uh, that are considered attached to the Affordable Care Act. This simply closes the loophole so that defrayal will occur for all proposed future mandates. And my hope is that it will force this committee and this legislature to take those proposals more seriously when they are attached with a fiscal note um, that implies, you know, this is exactly what this costs to the state, to the people of Minnesota, uh, and so forth. So. Uh, I, that was the reason for bringing it forward, and uh, I appreciate the members' input into, into the bill. And with that, Senator Frentz, uh, Senate File 1037, as amended, is laid over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator members. Bolden.
Welcome to the committee. Senator Bolden, Senate File 3993 is in front of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee members, for hearing this bill. Um, this is a bill around um, electronic assisted bicycles, or e-bikes, uh, which are uh, an excellent tool in our communities to uh, sort of expand access for people for biking. Um, this bill is intended to close a loophole or gray area to make them more safe. Um, the bill's provisions are around the classification, labeling, and selling uh, and operation of e-bikes, primarily to address an issue around um, uh, the, a gray area that allows uh, uh, the sale of some bikes to not meet the, the guidelines and limits set by federal and state law. So the bikes are sold with their motor controllers programmed within limits, so they cannot exceed a, a certain speed to keep them safe. Um, but uh, it happens that they are sold with sort of a wink and a nod, and, and, and they can tell people that, well, if you just clip this one wire, then those limits um, can be exceeded, um, to the point where they, these bikes then could go up to 50 miles an hour. And this has happened, and there have been crashes um, and significant injuries to people, um, including young people at times. And so wanting to um, eliminate that practice to be sure that we are keeping folks safe. Um, on again on e-bikes, which are um, an excellent uh, uh, means of transportation and recreation uh, that we want to um, you know be sure that people have access to, um, and so uh, we will hear from some testifiers, uh, Madam, or Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, um, and really just looking to uh, close that gray area loophole uh, to be able to keep people safe. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Before we go to testifiers, I believe you have an author's amendment, the A7. Senator Frentz offers the A7 amendment as an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Amendment is adopted. Uh, could I please have C.J. Lindor and Matt Moore come forward? Uh, Mr. Thank Lindor, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Klein and, and committee members. My name is Matt Moore, and I'm here on behalf of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota to speak in support of House File 38. Excuse me, Senate File 3993. I also serve as policy counsel for People for Bikes, a national advocacy group for cyclists, and the Trade Association for the U.S. Bicycle Industry. People for Bikes represents over 330 companies that make bicycles, electrical bi electric bicycles, and bicycle components and accessories. Uh, our customers are the bike shops in towns and cities uh, across Minnesota. Senate File 3993 contains changes to Chapter 325F that are designed to proactively address some emerging issues with products that are not electric-assisted bicycles but are being sold as such. This has resulted in vehicles that have excessive power or speed being used on trails, leading to conflicts with other cyclists and pedestrians, and concerns about the potential for crashes and injuries. Senate File 3993 therefore requires that if a seller describes their product in advertising as an electric bicycle, an electric bike, or an e-bike, but it is not an electric-assisted bicycle, they must disclose to the consumer the name or classification of the vehicle under state law and provide a disclosure statement in their advertising materials or website. Additionally, selling a motor vehicle as an electric-assisted bicycle or using the words electric bike, electric bicycle, or e-bike or other similar term without providing the required disclosure is treated as an unlawful trade practice under Section 325F.69, which uh, is the reason we're before this Commerce Committee today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My colleague CJ is here in case the committee has questions about any other aspects of the bill. Um, and I'm also happy to ask or answer any questions about uh, the changes to Chapter 325F. Thank you. Member questions or comments on the bill? Senator Bolden, any closing comments? I, I appreciate the committee's time, and we really just, like, as I said, are looking to close a loophole to help to keep people safe. Uh, the motion is on, uh, the question is on the motion of Senator Rest that uh, Senate File 3993 is amended, be recommended to pass and refer to the committee on finance. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 3993 is passed. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Rasmussen.
Senator Fowle, 5031 is in front of the committee. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last session, uh, the legislature passed a series of regulations on money transmitters. And the focus of that bill is on businesses who move money. Think about uh, check cashing companies, payment services like Western Union, PayPal, Venmo, et cetera. One issue that we have seen uh, since that bill was passed last year is that payroll processors, especially small payroll processing firms that are simply acting as an agent of the employers that they're contracted with, have been seeing uh, substantial compliance costs. And especially for the small uh, pay, uh, payroll processors that may have employees because of uh, e-work are able to go in other states. Uh, if we do not uh, exclude the payroll processors, they will have to have bonding and other compliance costs in all of the states that they participated in, including Minnesota. Um, and so this bill before the committee would exempt payroll providers uh, from this money transmitter uh, regulations while still keeping the protections uh, for the, the businesses that are primarily moving funds on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Mr. Chair, I also have a testifier with me today. Thank you. Melissa Reed, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am Melissa Reed with Park Street Public, and I'm here today on behalf of the Independent Payroll Providers Association, IPPA, and the Payroll Group, two associations representing over 300 payroll providers across the country. Our members consist of small to mid-sized regional payroll companies and represent only a small portion of the number of businesses potentially offering payroll services. We'd like to thank Senator Rasmussen for carrying 5031 to refine the money transmitter law adopted last session to clarify that payroll processors as official agents of employers are not also money transmitters, which would require additional and costly licensure. We also appreciate the Department of Commerce working with us during the interim to understand our concerns and their comfort with this language. There are over 28,000 payroll reporting agents registered nationally and 1,820 here in Minnesota, most with 20, employers, 20 employees or fewer. Many payroll processors are hired as agents of employers and make tax deposits and payments to employees on their employer's behalf. Employers sign IRS Form 8655, which specifically appoints a payroll processor as an agent of the employer. Because payroll processors are agents of their employer, they have no control over advance notice, as Senator Rasmussen discussed, uh, where their client chooses to pay an employee. For example, a client in Georgia may pay a remote employee for a few weeks in another state for completion of a project. A client may even choose to open an office in another state without any advance notice to their payroll processor. Due to this lack of control, a small payroll processor acting as an agent of their client would need to proactively register in all 50 states. The cost of registering in multiple states would put most small and mid-sized agent proce payroll processors out of business. Small regional payroll companies provide essential services to Minnesota, small businesses, uh, in addition, payroll processing and tax filing assistance, regional payroll processors act as business advisors and assist with wage and hour laws, evolving sick and safe time laws, paid family medical leave, and so much more. Due to the special relationship of payroll processors to the employees, employers that they work with and are uh, receive delegated authority through the IRS, uh, we request um, these exemptions be moved today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Member questions or comments on 5031? Uh, Senator Rasmussen, uh, Senate file 5031 is laid over. Members, uh, we need to take a brief recess while we wait for authors to arrive uh, in the room. Recess.
reports come out every day on the health consequences of vaping, it's important that we make sure our children are not being targeted by these vape, by, uh, vape companies. I want to specifically say thank you to Senator Duckworth for joining, Senator Housley, Senator Klein, and Senator Seeberger for joining me on this bill. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Gustafson, uh, at last minute, we had a, a person sign up to testify. Is Ms. Emily Myatt in the room? Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emily Myatt. I'm the Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network and co-chair of Minnesotans for a Smoke-Free Generation, um, a coalition of more than 50 organizations that are working to reduce the harms of commercial tobacco in Minnesota. I want to thank Senator Gustafson for sharing those concerns around youth use, youth tobacco, nicotine addiction. Um, as members consider the bill before you, I just wanted to, to put forward two concerns that our coalition has on this issue. Um, first, the products that are included in this bill are illegal under federal law. Um, the kinds of products listed are already not lawfully sold or, and are on the FDA's radar. Um, obviously, they're still showing up in schools, so I do want to acknowledge that. And the FDA has sent warning letters. Um, and then there's a whole process that retailers must follow through um, around specific actions they plan to take to address violations and remove the products that are illegally sold on their website. Um, we worry that passing another law that might be less comprehensive than relying on the FDA um, may have some unintended consequences through that piece. Um, second, the bill before you would leave many e-cigarettes on the market that are sold here in Minnesota that young people use, especially flavored vaping products, um, and appeal to young people. Um, I have one product in front of me um, that wouldn't be included in this bill. Um, and uh, we, again, appreciate the intent of looking at the appeal, right, pens, highlighters. But flavors are a big appeal to young people as well. It makes the product taste good, and it makes it harder to quit. So um, we would just encourage the legislature to continue to focus on evidence-based policies to reduce youth initiation, like Senate File 2123, which would end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Um, and we know that kids who vape are all more are more likely to dual use, so switching to menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products, and the flavored tobacco bill would take all of the products that uh, Senator Gufsison bill um, includes off the market along to other products. So again, thank you, Senator Gufsison, for sharing this goal, um, and thank you for hearing my remarks today. Thank you, members. And before we go to member questions, I have a suggestion to improve your bill, Senator Gustafson. Um, your section three is remedies and includes civil penalties and a private right of action. I'll have counsel speak to this uh, in just a moment, and I may have one of the members offer as an oral amendment. Um, these uh, provisions are likely unnecessary under implied attorney general enforcement authority, uh, and I think we may be covered if we delete section three. Uh, I'll go to Ms. Uh, uh, council to describe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Yes, under eight point, section 8.3, it generally states that the Attorney General shall investigate violations of the law of the state respecting um, unfair discriminatory and other unlawful practices in business, commerce, or trade. Under 8.31, um, that provides the Attorney General authority to enforce any violations under specifically 3.2, 325F, which is where this falls in statute. So Senator Gustafson, if I have uh, Senator Latz offer that as an oral amendment, can you speak to that? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would accept that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Latz offers the oral amendment. The, the council will report the oral amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Senator Latz moves to amend Senate File 4351. On page two, delete lines 11 to 18. Members understand the oral amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye, opposed. Amendment is adopted. Further member discussion on the bill. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Senate File 4351 is amended, will be laid over.
members, we have two more authors. Uh, we'll take a short recess again. If they don't show up in you know five to seven minutes, we'll adjourn for the day and try to uh, capture them another time. So thank you for your indulgence. We are in recess.
Senate file 3345 is in front of the committee. To your bill. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Um, Senate file 3345 is to help us phase out um, mercury that is contained in our current fluorescent bulbs. So now that we have newer technology and we have advanced over the years to more um, efficient systems like LED, but also more environmental, um, we bring this today to continue that process. Mercury is a well-known toxin. It has particularly dangerous effects on um, pregnant people and children, and especially in our land of 10,000 lakes, we have issue even with mercury in the water. In 2007, we became the first state to ban mercury in cosmetics and skin lightening creams. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, specific to lighting, we have many other alternatives, including um, LEDs, um, and they are more cost effective, longer lasting, and so many of us already have mercury-free lighting in our homes, schools, places of worship. Um, we have also talked to groups like waste haulers um, who don't want that exposure on the job, you know, if there's something in the trash, a, a light bulb in the trash, things like that. Um, so this is just another way to pres uh, preserve not only our environment in Minnesota, but all the people that could possibly come in contact with that. With that said, that is kind of the basic, um, getting us more rolled over to this cleaner, more environmental lighting, and I have two testifiers here today to talk a little bit more about that. Mr. Fowler, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the members of the committee. My name is Eric Fowler. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a senior policy associate at Fresh Energy uh, on our buildings team. Uh, we're a nonpartisan Minnesota-based energy policy nonprofit that is dedicated to advancing equitable carbon neutral economies. And I'm grateful to be uh, testifying in favor of this bill to, to make our lighting uh, safer, cleaner, and more efficient. So as we kind of heard, fluorescent lights are unnecessarily dangerous and wasteful. Uh, there is no such thing as a mercury-free fluorescent light, and the LED alternatives are mercury-free, um, efficient, uh, help cut our bills, and also help reduce peak lighting demand on the electric grid. Uh, so in 2022, the National Appliance Standards Awareness Project, uh, who we're gonna hear from in a moment, uh, did some estimations and found that in Minnesota in a single year by passing this bill, um, we would see savings of 681 gigawatt hours of electricity, which would also save $72 million in utility costs and translate to 92,000 metric tons of CO2 eliminated. Uh, so I hope you'll agree that this is a common sense policy. Uh, it has already been adopted in Vermont, California, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Maine, and I hope that we will join them in saying farewell to mercury-based lighting. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Fowler. Mr. McClenney, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Josh McClenney. I work for the Appliance Standards Awareness Project. I'm here to support, or speak in support of SF3345 and reinforce that LED technology is affordable, reliable, and ready to go. ASAP published a report in 2022 evaluating the lighting market asking that very question, are LEDs ready? We found the answer is yes, they are now widely available and cost effective as alternatives to fluorescence. We found that LEDs are twice as energy efficient, which creates significant electricity bill savings. They last two to three times longer than fluorescence, and of course, as we've heard, they don't contain mercury by design. Not only do we find that LEDs are ready to go operationally, but they're widely available, LEDs are designed to be drop-in replacements for fluorescence. In most cases, you can just pop out your existing fluorescent and pop in an LED. We found that LEDs are better for both folks' back pockets. They've come down in price dramatically the last 10 years. Statewide, by 2050, ASAP calculates that Minnesota could see a cumulative bill savings of $947 million on utility bill savings. Uh, the most common type of fluorescent bulb is the four-foot T8. We found that LED replacements on average cost just 11 cents more per bulb. That 11 cents is recovered in less than a month due to utility bill savings. Since 2022, eight different states have passed nearly identical policies ending the sales of common fluorescent light bulbs because of the findings that LEDs are now widely available to go and cost effective as replacements for fluorescence. I hope Minnesota will join them. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. Members, questions or comments on the bill? Senator Mitchell, Senate File 3345. Well, the question on the motion of Senator Rest that Senate File 3345 be recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? You're on your way. Thank you. Members, uh, I don't think Senator McEwen is going to be available for our last bill, so we are going to adjourn shortly. Just a couple program notes on tomorrow. Um, we will release the policy omnibus language this afternoon as soon as it is available. Uh, I don't think there will be any surprises in there for members. Um, tomorrow we'll do just a little bit of catch-up work by hearing the McEwen uh, bill on uh, kiosks and uh, take up off the table once again the junk fees bill of Senator Port uh, with amendments that she has worked on with the industry. Uh, then we will have the, the task of uh, hearing and passing through uh, the Department of Cannabis Management uh, Omnibus Policy Bill uh, that will be carried by Senator Port, and then our own uh, omnibus policy bill, uh, which will be available for markup at that time. Uh, we'll convene at... 10 a.m. tomorrow. Senator Rest. Tomorrow morning, this chamber at 10 a.m. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll be chairing Judiciary Committee at that time and for the whole day. I'm not sure if I can break away. Maybe to check in, and that'll be it. We'll take you when we can get you, Senator. All right, members, the committee is adjourned.